not fond, it doesn't matter. Hi everyone and welcome to Portal. Uh, my name is Harriet Gaffney. I'm the Artistic Director of Portal and I'm the Arts Development Officer for the Surf Coast Shire. Thanks so much for joining us for this second last of our Sunday morning sessions, Art, Activism and Place. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the lands on which this session is being held today. Uh, Portal is brought to you live from the traditional lands of the Wadarong and Eastern Ma people of the Kulin Nations. We acknowledge them as the traditional owners and protectors of this place. And we acknowledge their ancestors who cared for the land, rivers and sea and all things living for thousands of generations. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. The ability of Shire residents to connect daily with this extraordinary country, our incredible environment, is one of the most valued aspects of life on the surf coast. So it's little wonder that so many of our creatives articulate the importance of caring for country through their work, finding art of whichever medium as the perfect vehicle to articulate their message with, with the world. Sorry, I didn't read my own words. In her artist bio, panelist Deidre Carmichael spoke of her belief in art's ability to shift consciousness, something I think everyone sitting here today believes passionately because we've experienced it firsthand. Before I pass over to the panel, however, I want to encourage everyone watching to express their thoughts about the session via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We're using a different format this week as we have the last couple of weeks. So when you do go to say hello or to give us your thoughts or to type in your questions, meet, please make sure that you click the drop down that selects all panelists and attendees. And that means that the panelists will be able to see your questions and your comments. Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator for this session, Portal's program manager, someone who goes above and beyond in everything that she does, even to the point of working on the morning of her 50th birthday, Stacey Bobeal. Stacey is a Jan Jupp based writer and editor. Her past lives have included working as a curator and arts administrator, and she's also had stints in events, communications, and marketing for higher education. As a passionate advocate for the arts and environment, she's undertaken numerous voluntary roles with grassroots organizations and arts enterprises. She currently runs her own writing and editing business alongside helping to put this whole portal program together, Logophilic, a business specifically developed to assist artists and creatives with the written word. Thanks, Stacey, and happy birthday, darling. It's so nice to have you here doing this for us. Thank you, Harry. Those lovely words, and it's been a pleasure to work alongside you. For the last few months, it's been fantastic. Um, so, yeah, good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to this morning's um, panel session. Um, I, too, would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the land on, on which I am today, um, the Wadawurrung people, and pay respect to traditional methods of this custodianship and connection to country that many Australians are yet to fully grasp. Um, I pay respect to elders past, present and those emerging into these roles. Um, connection to country, as Harriet just mentioned, and connection to nature is central to our conversation this morning. And I acknowledge that our nation collectively has much to learn and gain from this ancient wisdom and knowledge of our First Nations people. Um, it may seem like 100 years ago, but let me take you back to a time before COVID, um, the summer of 2019, 2020, um, when we'd experienced a summer of bushfires like no other. Um, the world watched as almost half the east coast of Australia burned, fires that had been burning since the middle of 2019. And when rains finally came to help exhausted firefighters get them under control, 18.6 million hectares lay burnt. Um, beyond the human cost of 34 lives, the impact to wildlife and habitat was severe and heartbreaking um, and the true cost of these fires um, and the impact they've had on the natural environment may indeed never be known. Um, a particularly devastating bushfire and microcosm was that on Kangaroo Island, where habitats of animals seen only on that island were completely destroyed in a matter of days, over half its koala population perishing along with almost all of the island's forest and bushland. 
Um, and despite being many miles from any fire, parts of Victoria and New South Wales were blanketed in smoke for weeks on end, leaving our days sepia toned and adding to the apocalyptic feel that our summer had taken on. But 2020 had some new surprises and it seems once again that the most prescient threat to our survival as a species has been pushed aside with the discussion of the Morrison government's plans for a coal and gas led revival post COVID. Um, this shows that even if the message of climate change has gotten through, it has not changed an agenda of greed and, um, and greed over and above um, concern for our biodiversity, an agenda that has once again dismissed the incalculable value of our natural environment. All of our guests today have engaged in various battles for the preservation of Mother Nature. The planet will go on without us regardless of its state but it's the land, rivers and sea and its inhabitants, including us, that will not. Through a deep appreciation of the natural environment, the work of these artists um, has in different ways drawn attention to issues both local and global in a gentle form of activism that is unique to artistic practice and its products. And rather than approach these issues as a war, doing battle with hate and opposition, these artists have appealed to our shared commonalities, bringing attention to the threats that Mother Nature is experiencing. One of these battles is with plastic um, and the fight for awareness on the issue of marine debris, something that all of these artists here today have addressed through their work. But I'll start with you, Deidre, um, and your Plastic Catch project. Um, Deidre, can you give an overview of, the pro of um, your pathway to this project and, and what it involved? I'll just get an image up. Um. Yeah, well, the Plastic Catch project was something I just did to help raise awareness about the impacts of um, uh, single-use plastic. And in particular, I decided to just target one waste stream, and that's the little plastic soy sauce fish that you get with sushi. Because these are produced in their billions, and yet they're not recycled. They're going straight to landfill, or they're going... Um, into our drains and straight into the ocean. And they're estimated to last about 500 years, even though we use them for like a few seconds. So although the plastic's recyclable, they're not getting recycled. Mm -hmm. And I just thought I would try and bring some awareness about this by doing some art. And what I do is I um, position these paintings in public places for people to find and keep. And I just mount the paintings on a piece of cardboard, biodegradable, <laughs> and um, just uh, say it's a free painting for people to pick up and keep if they would like. And so far I've dropped off about, I think 26 paintings. And um, I ask people if they feel like it, they can send me a photo of their new painting in their new home. And I've received about half um, photos of people's paintings in their new home and people are generally very encouraging and say it's great that um, they didn't know those facts about them not being recycled and so it's just helping to raise awareness. I guess um, being left in a public forum too where people least expect it these beautiful little gems because that's what they look like they're like the a lot of them are put on a background of the of something like the ocean. Um, I think you've done several others that are like sitting on really a hyper realistic um, pebbles and stones as they've washed up on the beach. Yes. Um, so yeah. So I guess the surprise of coming on them must be um, must add to the I guess the impact of it. Yeah, I think that was sort of part of the idea that you're making this intervention in a public space where that elements of, of surprise can maybe cut through um, and just, yeah, it's a way of um, trying to bring a message through. Yeah, through the element of surprise. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I know we had like a number of them printed out last year for the Surf Coast Arts Trail. Um, as part of our promotions, we had one of your plastic catch images. Um, printed out on postcards and I think you've been doing something with the leftovers from those too haven't you? Oh yeah well the um, postcards I have sent off to different sushi shops and um, just requesting that they stop handing these out automatically 
because I guess in a way these these little fish are symbolic of um, just this our, our addiction for convenience and the huge impact it's having on our environment. And it's just such small changes. If sushi sh shops stopped handing them out and just use the sauce bottle, yeah. um, it, it, that can be just one little thing that will help in this fight to stop this huge tide of plastic that's um, going into our oceans. I mean, I used to be a volunteer for caring for our bays and I've seen firsthand it is just phenomenal. And we are in a very clean country and let alone countries like Asia where they haven't got the recycling systems that we have. And, um, yeah, it's just small steps one at a time. Yeah, and I think we've spoken before about um, how we're sort of doing ourselves a little bit of a disservice because we have such good waste management systems that a lot of people don't actually see um, the results of, um, you know, our addiction to convenience because by the time we get up and go for the walk on our beaches, there are a number of other people who do the cleaning up for us and, you know, and, and having the benefits of a, of a good waste system means that we don't get to see it. Well, actually, I would question whether we do have a good waste system. Um, just the fact that we've been misled by the plastic industry where they put that recycling logo on the plastic and you think it's being recycled. It's just technically it's recyclable, but it's not necessarily that our recycling systems can cope with it. Mm. And, and that crisis came to a head, didn't it, last year? Yeah, like yeah. And even um, the other one too, there's um, the cardboard um, containers that you get with your soy milk or um, chicken stock or things like that. Um, they look like they're recyclable because it's got the recycling logo, but they're all going to landfill too. Mm. It's all about awareness. So this led to your objects of the Anthropocene? Yes, yeah, so this painting is just of everyday objects of single-use plastic, which I've done in the style of the old Dutch masters because i had been to Florence and learned, uh, learned traditional oil painting techniques. And so I wanted to use that and sort of convey them in a way that makes you look twice maybe that plastic bag you'd think was a cloth but it's just a throwaway object and um, I also included a baroque wallpaper background because the flamboyant extravagance of the baroque kind of ties in with our excessive consumption of plastic and um, yeah I'm hoping that one day these objects will be like just in a museum, you won't be able to find them anymore. And it'll be just symbolic of our human folly at the time. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be nice if that actually does come to pass? <laughs> we can only hope. Yeah. I'll go on to um, this painting, Deidre. This is um, one of my favourites. And um, yeah, anyway, from your visit to the Tarkine at the beginning of this year, um, and you participated in a, um, an exhibition um, hosted by the Bob Brown Foundation. That's right. Um, and uh, I gather that event was um, a celebration of activists on the front line, um, but all of the works that are, have been included um, were, were tinged with not just pathos but, but grief, and, and this one in particular speaks to this. I, I find the face of this owl so gut-wrenching. And despite, you know, it, it, he... It, it's like he's, he's devoid of expression, but somehow you've imbued him with this sense of like stoic loss and mourning. Um. Yeah, well, when I um, I went down to uh, Takania, which is the Aboriginal word for that area, and it's not a defined area on a map. It sort of encompasses rainforest, farmland, coastline. It's a whole range in range of different landscapes in the um, Tasmanian northwest area. And I visited the camp that had been set up in the sumac forest, which had been earmarked for logging. And the Bob Brown Foundation had um, activists there who were in the trees. And the masked owl is uh, an endangered species down in Tasmania now due to all the excessive logging that's been going on. And in this particular forest, I saw for myself the old growth trees that 
that would have been cut down if this logging had gone ahead. And of course, the, old, the masked owl lives in the hollows of these old growth trees and um, is losing its habitat left, right and centre. Anyway, a good news story is that um, the sumac forest has been removed from the three year logging plan, but it's only for three years. It's nothing, it's not like permanent. Um, so it is a win and hopefully a win the more thought. pressure we can apply to governments, uh, the more wins we can get. Mm, it's an ongoing, an, an ongoing battle to keep it in the, I guess, the public eye. Um, That's more right. than um, and, and out of, um, I, I guess, part of that exhibition, how did this come about, like your involvement in Thousand Finches? Was it before um, the Bob Brown exhibition or? Yes. So this was um, about August last year when um, the Queensland government had given the final approval for the Adani mine by allowing their black-throated finch management plan to go ahead. Mm. And the management plan was basically just saying that well, we're going to clear their native habitat and they can just move to an area we've set aside um, for them to live in. But of course, they would live in that area now if that was what they needed. <laughs> it's grassland that they need. Anyway, so when we heard that um, the Adani mine was getting its final approval, we, uh, well, a Melbourne artist, Charlotte Watson, put a call out on social media and asked artists to send artworks to politicians expressing their grief because this bird, the little black-throated finch, will become extinct if the mine goes ahead. And scientists have given that, um, that view mm. and it's like spelling a death knell for the bird. So we all um, banded together and I think there was over 1,600 um, artworks that got sent to politicians and it was just an, a collective expression of grief not just for this little bird that's facing extinction but for the thousands and thousands of animals and wildlife that is facing extinction due to our, our corporate greed basically and um, this is going to be happening in our lifetime so it was kind of a little bit, it was very sad, but also we were trying to transform our grief into action, I guess. And although we haven't won the fight, the, the mine is going ahead, I think this will still have ripple effects and we still have to have hope that things are turning and that if we just have to keep up the pressure and keep on trying to remind people of what's at stake. Mm. And it'd have to be a fairly hard-hearted um, politician receiving these beautiful little missives to not have that just nag away at their subconscious, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I sent mine to uh, Susan Lay, the Environment Minister, but I never received any acknowledgement that she's received it. Mm. And we sort of have this joke that they've probably all just been stashed in a cupboard hiding under a whole lot of coal mine submissions. <laughs> well, I, I, I can't imagine that that could possibly be the case. I mean, when I first saw this, so it, it actually made me cry, this image, because it, it is so beautiful. And how you've um, put it on top of um, Bill McKibben's book is just so, yeah, anyway. Um, it's, it, yeah, because Bill McKibben's book was uh, from 1989, a classic environmental book. <laughs> And in it, he's warning of the dangers of climate change. Mm. So, you know, how far have we come? Yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Someone celebrating their 50th birthday today. I do know that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, but speaking of that, like, expression of grief, because I think that collective expression, as you said before, was made by a number of artists participating in that Thousand Finches project. Um, but, and, and how that expression can come to be something positive. Um, and Rich, I'll move to you now. Um, you've spoken about the act of creation um, as itself being a form of activism or um, a form of positive action and how 
this might be harnessed for positive application. Um, I know in both your practice and in your writing, um, you know, that, that, you know, you've probably got a lot of experience in this area. Can you like elaborate on this and um, give us some insight into how that might have informed your um, 100 Dawns project? Yeah, thanks, Stacey. And thanks for sharing, Deidre. I just feel your work's just stunning. And uh, to share that so broadly for the awareness, you know, the simple things really do make a difference. And um, when everyone's doing simple things, we're all making a difference. So thanks, Deidre. For me, you know, the, the system of nature is one that's co-creative. You know, there's nothing in nature that exists in solitude on its own. And uh, even those asexual creatures still, uh, you know, have oxygen and other things that they take into exist. And humans are very much the same, you know, we're, we're co-creative beings and part of that is uh, how we connect and engage with nature. You know, if, if you ever want to have a deeper understanding of how long you can last without nature, just hold your breath. And most people can't really do that for more than 30, 60 seconds. If you train, you can do it for a bit longer, but you can't, for, you can't last without nature for a few minutes. And, you know, it's the first thing we do is draw breath. So our life is a co-creation, moment to moment, breath by breath with mother nature. She provides our air. She provides uh, all our vitamins, minerals, our food, our fresh water, everything we need to exist as a species. And um, that's, that's an important understanding I feel for humans to really capture and, and you know, walk that and, and embody that, which is we are a species in an ecosystem. Whereas uh, in modern society, there's uh, been a huge amount of conditioning around where our species that are in control and have the, uh, you know, the, the right to uh, use and exploit nature for whatever means we choose. And, um, you know, there's been a few golden eras of that, if you like, but we're certainly, uh, you know, with the shifts in climate change and what I much prefer to call a human impact emergency, because uh, that really defines what the source of uh, the issues are with our, um, you know, our, our damaged environment and the effects that not just humans, but every species are unfortunately experiencing. So when I actually did 100 Dawns, um, there was more the intention in the beginning. I did this uh, practice in 2016 from summer through to winter, and it was to raise funds for mental health services. And the challenge was to go down to Bells Beach and, and local beaches and meditate in the pre-dawn dark and the pre-dawn light and then uh, go into the ocean for the sunrise. So I was physically in the ocean surfing or swimming if there were no waves uh, for every sunrise from summer through to winter for 100 dawns in a row. And being someone who's always written poetry and verse and songs, um, each sentiment of meditation in the morning just happened to arise as poetry. And uh, so I ended up, you know, I created a blog to attract followers. I had a dawn photo um, and then I had this little verse, which was anything from eight, 10 words to 30, 50 words. And it just captured the essence of what my meditation was about, which was all, always very much deeply entwined with the nature that I was experiencing. And, uh, and then, so the intention around the mental health was to demonstrate the value of number one, connecting with nature for your mental health and this was a beautiful practice, but there's also a huge body of psychological and other literature around well-being that shows the efficacy of connecting with nature. And then we all just know intuitively where do most people go for their holiday? They go somewhere like the bush or the beach to uh, really check out of the busyness of our modern world and, and, and refresh and reconnect. And then the second part was intentional self-study so that uh, you know, meditation is an example of practice, uh, if, it's, you know, if that's your intention, with it, to understand yourself more deeply and uh, what we do discover is that Mother Nature is like a narrative for human nature. Everything that happens out in the ocean, in the skies, in the, in the trees also happens within us. And I love those photos of uh, fruits and other things that look exactly like part of our internal organs, you know, or, um, you know, there's lots of art like that as well. So for me, writing has been a way that, uh, you know, being someone who's been a coastal volunteer, uh, since I first moved to the surf coast in 91, the first thing I, uh, I did was a, a working bee was saying how uh, surfers appreciate a natural environment way back then. And then, uh, you know, I gave around 20 odd years of volunteer time as surf rider and a few other groups and more recently just spending more time with saying the working bees we do at Bells. I, there was a real shift for me, uh, particularly around some of the 
uh, stronger campaigns that were happening, uh, particularly the uh, attempts to develop bells in what the local community felt was the wrong way uh, about a decade ago. And I, uh, being a psychologist, my work is all mental. And then when I'm in the volunteer space, I got into areas where it was all mental as well. You're writing letters to politicians. You're doing a lot of mental work to try and predict what behaviours might be happening, how you could make a good impact. And a lot of it's about protesting what you don't want. And so that you can get pretty burnt out when you're doing that over you know decades. So I really shifted into what I want to do is just illuminate the love of what I do want. And for me, the, that essence of 100 Dawns was about when you connect with nature and you start to see the beauty of it and you start to receive all its gifts consciously, then you're going to care for it more. You know, And, and what we're deeply connected to we care for well, that we care for with, uh, really well. So that, that's kind of the underlying intention of 100 Dawns is um, when people connect more deeply with nature, they're more likely to care for it. Simple things like using a bottle instead of a plastic fish with your sushi through to, you know, uh, we have lots of other artists, particularly people that can, you know, poetry is not something that tends to get too much of a high profile, high profile, but musicians and sometimes filmmakers and people like that can really reach broad audiences with their art. And with awareness, then you have, you know, you're informed and you're also, uh, for me, being touched at this level, at the level of the heart. And uh, for me, the mind's just a tool that we use to manifest the love and truth and the beauty of our heart. And when we're in tune with that, which is our divine purpose to be at one with nature, then uh, we're going to use the mind and think first about nature and then act for nature and then humanity. Because uh, as I shared, we're just another species. We're just another ant on the ant here. And I guess too, Richie, like the the whole idea behind surface appreciating the natural environment was bringing that connection of, which I don't think a lot of surfers are very conscious of a lot of the time of their their actual connection to nature. You know, I think they think of surfing as surfing and and nothing else, and they they don't see, uh, I guess, the impacts of what they do necessarily, or um, you know, their their sheer reliance on Mother Nature is providing for them. Um, yeah, surfing is a funny uh, experience in that way. And, and uh, you know, you spend all your time out in the ocean, but you're sitting on a piece of equipment and wearing a piece of equipment and have a tethering device from your board to your ankle that's all petrochemical based. <laughs> and uh, it's been like that um, pretty much since foam and fiberglass came in. Uh, before that, it was actually a bit more environmentally friendly with the olives and their layers and the yeah. and things like that from, uh, you know, last century or, you know, 1800, early 1900s. But it, it, it is quite interesting because, it's, again, it's all about your intention. And uh, some people go to the beach to go surfing as if they're going to a tennis court to play tennis. I'm just going to go get my waves and off I go. So there's no actual deeper connection. It's more an activity I do. Um, but, you know, the, the ocean offers so many lessons for life as well as, you know, that uh, opportunity to develop an intimate relationship with something greater, Mother Nature. And, uh, you know, that's where the deeper care comes. And I remember what, Dawn 38, um, what, one of the sentiments that came through, I'll just share it for you briefly if you'd like. The wave beckons free a blank canvas for my art, a place to draw lines with the rhythm of my heart. So there really is this opportunity, the moment you take off on a wave to be in a real whole being experience of oneness with that wave. And the irony is, you know, doing a lot of work in performance psychology, when you're performing at your peak or the flow state, it might be performance, it might just be an experience of communion with nature. There is a divine sense of oneness. There is no separation. This co-creation becomes a, an intimate connection of oneness. And it's yeah. just so beautiful. And, and that experience is what really drives my passion and love to care for nature. Yeah, so that appreciation and awareness of, of nature actually adds to the surfing experience more than anything. Well, that's um, right, and uh, particularly when you get a bit older, hey, Stacey, because you're yeah. not <laughs> around catching 40 waves every session. So having that um, connection to the nature allows you to still really enjoy your surfing when, you know, the body might be going through a bit of injury or you've got some other challenge going on you can still experience and engage surfing in so many waves or even like the beautiful photo you've shared just that uh, looks like one of the, one of the working bees we've done on the, the bell's headland there of just removing invasive weeds and putting you know restoring vegetation with indigenous seedlings 
Yeah, and that group's just one group that's done like so much um, to um, preserve, I guess, the beauty of our coastline here in the immediate vicinity of Torquay. Um, so, and I'll I'll go to John now because John is actually has actually been involved with Surfrider Foundation for many years now, um, and uh, one of the more recent events that John was involved with. Um, was the fight for the bike campaign, and um, and and I guess Surf Rider sort of emerged as a, that direct connection between passion and place. And um, the fight for the bike campaign has been a very successful one, or one of the ones that we can actually say yes, we, the outcome um, has come to fruition that everyone wanted, and that was to stop drilling in the bike. Um, but, so, John, you and I were discussing these images yesterday and you mentioned that this paddler circle could be considered, you know, possibly the largest ever art installation in a public place on the South Coast. And, um, yeah, some of the images that of this paddler circle that were organised by um, Damien Cole and the Bike for the Bike campaign were just wonderful, like just beautiful, because it, it, it highlights, um, I guess, the beauty of our coastline and shows also like the power of the people really in one single image. That's right. Um, welcome everyone. How are we all going? <laughs> Good. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to take a step <laughs> back before I start talking about this particular event because I think it's really important to understand that um, when you're putting on a, a, an event like this, a, a paddle out, which we, we never knew how many people were going to turn up. We had four rallies last year in Torquay and we had 2,000 the first one, just over 2,000 for the second one in Easter. We had four or 500 in September and then, of course, November 23, we had another 2,000 people turn up. So to have thousands and thousands of people turn up for these events has been just quite radical. But there's a real intention behind what we did and there are two particular goals. One was how can we harness the community energy and the, because when, when the community found out that there were plans by Equinor to drill in the Great Australian Bight and there was a potential for an oil spill to travel right along our beautiful coast all the way literally up to Port Macquarie, that generated enormous amount of outrage. And it was like, and I know it's Surf Rider and I know Patagonia, the discussions were, how do we harness that energy? And that's where the paddle outs became a really important part of, firstly, just harnessing that energy, giving the community some sort of voice. But then, of course, the, there's the fact that when you do um, community activism, you're trying to raise the profile of an issue, you're trying to get it in the media, you're trying to get in the community, you're trying to actually get in front of the eyeballs of the decision makers. So um, it's really, really important when you do that, that you have something visual to, to do that. I mean, the, the, the great thing about the digital world we live in is that you can do an event like this and literally within half an hour, these images were traveling around the world through the through the social media mm -hmm. um, and and so what you have to do is this is where art can become really important because if you are going to create an event raise the profile of an issue you need to be visually creative you have to come up with some really interesting creative ways of creating an event creating an action so that you can um, get people's attention and that's where art comes in because you have to be visually creative if we had and look we did it we had um, you know, Damo and a bunch of speakers on the beach doing the talk, blah, blah, blah. Well, look, we've all seen a million rallies where people have stood on the beach doing the talks and all that. But it's these images, these photos of these thousands of people out in the ocean. They're the images that people were really excited by. And they're the images that went right around the world. I think it's also really important to think about when you're talking about fight for the bite as an issue, art came into it in a range of different ways and a range of different levels. You had, let's look at this event here, you had the speeches, you had the paddle out, you had all those people, even the kids, doing little posters, doing banners. So a lot of people were getting really creative. They are pulling out their surfboards, writing Fight for the Bite on their surfboards, creating flags and all that. So it created this whole micro uh, creative activity at that level. Then you had the paddle out. Um, then you had people, we had people who'd written songs about it. You had filmmakers, you had photographers. So when you're talking about how art can, can work in the public space, uh, it can uh, operate on a whole lot of different levels. And Fight for the Bite is probably a really, really good case study where it, it permeated throughout the event 
um, and was represented in many, many different ways. Yeah, and I think Damo did a really good job of harnessing all those wonderful images and getting them out there. Like he had a fantastic social media following, did really well in getting all of those um, images out. And there were some great ones too. And I know you took quite a few of them, John, um, and I will show one at the end of this talk because um, we'll be talking about hope at the end of the discussion. Yeah, and um, one of the images that you sent through was particularly powerful of um, Dave on the beach. Um, but uh, I guess we'll go now to, if I can, um, to your Respect Point Impossible film. Okay, um, so, yeah. Um, look, this is, this is something I, we did about f four years ago now. Um, as you know, our coast is under threat. You know, we, we, we look all around us, you know, um, there's a lot of development. With development comes pollution. There's a whole lot of issues. We're seeing a lot of encroachment of development on uh, our, our wetlands, our farmlands, our woodlands, our grasslands. So we're, we're progressively seeing more and more of the coast growing. And with that comes impacts. Um, and look, Surfride has been involved in Point Impossible uh, going back to back 1995. So back then, uh, as a group, we were looking at Point Impossible and people were driving everywhere. Surfers weren't doing the bright thing. Um, um, there's midden sites there that we're all driving over and camping over and mm. shitting in and all that sort of stuff. And so we, we, we did a really collaborative thing. We started to work with the land managers and we started to talk with the local Indigenous community and, and came up with a bit of a plan for Point Impossible. And so that's when um, we started to uh, pull the cars back from uh, the midden sites started to formularise the, the car parking and do a little bit of planting. And so that was the first stage of trying to really protect Point Impossible. Um, and then, we've, you know, we go back there, we're involved in, um, you know, beach cleanups and weeding and planting and all that to this day. Now, the opportunity came to do a video about somewhere along the coast and about how it's under pressure. And in some ways, you know, my, my initial thought was, well, let's do bells. But then again, you know, bells in some way has been done to death. And I thought, well, let's look at somewhere like Point Impossible. A lot of people know and don't know it, but Point Impossible is, is just a really, really unique area. It has, it's like an onion. It's got multiple layers. You can go down there. It's got its natural history. It's a very beautiful place. It's got its indigenous history, which is incredibly rich and incredibly mm -hmm. deep. It's got its, its Western history, um, William Buckley. It's got... It's surfing history where it goes back about 50 years. It's already always been a really, there's always been a really tight knit bunch of people who go to Posso's. They, they really love it. It's really, really important to them. And of course, now it's also got the, um, the craft wetlands where mm -hmm. you've got birds flying from Alaska and Japan and the Soviet Union coming down here each year to, to nestle at this little place, which is literally just outside of Torquay. It's an incredibly uh, important and significant wetland, but it's under threat. And so the, through making the Respect Point Impossible video, I just wanted to tell the stories and talk to local people and say, why is this place important? And that, that really wasn't hard for them to explain. It's, it's important to them for a whole lot of reasons, whether it's the surfing, the nature of the environment, but also what were the threats. And at that point, we started to explore things like overdevelopment, over tourism, um, you know, the impact, the, the fact that you've got the huge Torquay North Estate backs right onto it, and that creates a whole lot of problems, whether it's fresh water running into what's a saline environment, whether it's the cats getting out at night and running amok amongst mm -hmm. all the birds. So that, with that little video, um, it became a really important educational tool, um, which has been seen by, I think, two or 3,000 people online. Um, I teach at Geelong High School. I showed it to a few teachers. They showed it to a whole bunch of students. Um, and soon, you know, two or 300 students at Geelong High School had seen it. Um, and that was last year. And this year, they've even arranged, uh, before we went into lockdown, um, we had a bunch of Year 12 students come out just a couple of weeks ago and do some work out there with one of the rangers um, in, in the wetlands. So it's really great where through something like a short film or a video, you can communicate uh, what's happening about a place and why it's important. And then to see it flow on to where you've got kids coming out there and doing some work to help protect the site. That's a really, it's a really amazing outcome. Yeah. And, and I think too, um, you said, uh, like you've done a really good job within that very short film, like, and you've just cut, touched on each of those, like, cause it is quite an incredible area for, 
for its importance to a number of different people. Um, and I didn't realise, um, I, I only recently became aware of its Indigenous significance through um, Karina. And, um, and I think through watching the film itself, that idea of it being a home to migratory birds and, and just that thought in my own head of birds flying thousands of kilometres only to come to a wetland to find that it's not there anymore or it's, you know, dried up yeah. or it doesn't have the right balance about it anymore because of the, you know, excessive amount of fresh water going in there now from the development around it. Like you've brought all these really dry ideas together, you know, <laughs> essentially, but in a 20, I think it's 25 minutes, isn't 25 it? 25 minutes, 25 yeah. minute film that is, I guess, easily digestible for everyone. And like you said, school children, um, high school children, sit through, watch it, take something away from it and want to be involved. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that film has about it. Yeah, and you're in it too. Yeah, <laughs> as I discovered the other day. <laughs> So yeah, anyway, um, I've lost my notes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, we'll put up um, a link to John's film too on the Arts Trail Facebook page, if that's okay, John. That'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, so happy. everyone can have a look at that. Um, and I'll also send out um, links to all of the issues we'll be talking about today um, in an email to those people who have registered via um, Eventbrite. Um, uh, all of the other things will, will pop on the Facebook feed for um, Arts Trail. Now, I'm assuming Peter's still there because Peter's actually dropped off my, my little images on the side. And um, so I'm hoping he's still there. Peter, are you there? Yeah, yeah still here. Still here. Great. So. <laughs> Great. I think I'm going to have to change my view or something to be able to see you. Um, Peter is coming to us live from Forest this morning, but he's been a bit further down the coast um, during ISO. Um, Peter's a... Um, a sculptor and um, installation artist um, who's been working in this area for, for many years. Um, but Peter, like talking to John about working um, with kids in schools, um, you've done multiple projects with schools and school children. And um, when we were talking the other day, we discussed how children is just so receptive to different ways of thinking and that they're great vehicles for, um, for these messages to get to the broader community. Um, can you tell us about your um, Brogger Crossing project to start off with? Yeah, sure, Stacey. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so inspired to hear the other three artists and what they're doing, not knowing that much about the work that you three do, but, yeah, well done. It's just so inspiring to hear it. Um, my two streams of creativity or life, if you like, are um, environment and um expression through making and so over many years I've been lucky enough to combine the two my two passions um, so I now do a lot of work with school groups um, teaching kids through the making of sculpture about the environment so it's sort of I call it espionage I'll go into a school and <laughs> and we'll have a lot of fun and we'll be making things and inadvertently it becomes a science and an ecology lesson. And without even knowing, the, the students end up with all this knowledge, in this case, about the Brolga. So um, it's a lot of fun and it's proving to be successful. Uh, they've picked the ball up now out there at BIAC where the Brolga is, um, it's Brolga habitat out there. Many people think Brolgas are only in the top end of Australia. We've got them an hour away from where you guys are all sitting now. And these are amazing birds, 1.8 metre high, taller than most of us, uh, Australia's largest crane. Uh, their habitat's threatened. So I knew about the Brolga and I was invited to do a project <clears throat> out there with the school and decided, well, let's talk about the Brolga. So we made a range of different sculptures. The image you see here is what I call the Brolga billboards. So I'm, a, I, with all due respect, a real estate agent, so I'm quite um, disgusted at the big signs they put up all along our, <coughs> our um, landscape advertising <coughs> houses for their, um, for their personal gain. So I thought, well, let's just start playing with that uh, format. So these are woven screens, same size as real estate billboards. 
And we made these with the students <clears throat> using the negative space to depict the brolga. And we just put them in different areas out in the Western District, speaking to the landowners, owners, we got permission to use paddocks and we would rotate them through the landscape <clears throat> over many months. And um, it generated a lot of interest in the brolga and in the habitat and like people would be driving past and just go, what the fuck was that, you know? And then there's an inquiry begins at that point. So I really believe the first step is inquiry, second step is connection, and then you have some sort of relationship with, with the environment. So um, that's, that's basically what we're doing. And the Brolga Pathways Project has now linked up with Birds Australia and ornithologists and each Brolga that is sited out in that area by families, by students is sent to a database and there's, there's a wide um, wealth of knowledge being gathered about where these birds are, which in turn helps to protect their habitat. So yeah, Brogger Pathways is, is ongoing. You can Google that and have a look and, and see what we're doing out there. Fantastic. And, and I guess that is that physical engagement with an artwork that has a, um, forms a different, I guess, route for awareness and I guess interest in something. Um, Connor, we've got um, the, a little YouTube clip from um, some work that you did with the lawn sculptor Biennale a couple of years ago. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. Connor's going to weave his magic and actually going to pop it up on everyone's screen soon. But you had a really lovely little quote there, Peter, that said, our innate sense of play arises as the creative nature within is set free. Here is where learning and discovery begins. So yeah, I think that, um, I guess, you're, uh, you're starting to learn without even knowing. But, uh, yeah, yeah, well, there's, uh, as all of you are aware, and there's a lot of research has gone into this, that um, in education, it's, it's really about having fun. If, if children or any of us are having fun, then we're going to absorb knowledge. So I work with that um, in the programs I do. And this image, I can see it on the screen here. It's not moving, but basically we set up a big um, screen in a tent on the lawn foreshore and I got all these... Um, recycled woolen yarns from op shops and just had all the colours in on the ground and kids could just wander up, pick up the the wool and just start weaving in and out of the screen, one child on one side and one on the other. So they pass it through the other. So they're learning collaboration, they're drawing in space, they're playing with colour. Um, and they're learning about upcycling materials at the same time. So I was fortunate to get that gig for three lawn sculpture events um, through Graham Wilkie, uh, who's a great old friend of mine. And we used the platform to talk about nature and habitat while anyone came along, they could participate in the sculpture workshops. But we use a lot of uh, recycled materials and and, um, you know, it's once again, it's espionage. We're using, we're getting the message through, um, yeah. hopefully, through, through in that case, the Lawn Sculpture um, Biennale platform. Connor, did you want to play that now? And we'll just have a quick look at that. Hi, how are you going? I'm Peter Day. Um, what we've got going on behind me here is a, a sculpture workshop, which is part of Lawn Sculpture uh, Biennale. It gets momentum when you get 15, 20 kids inside the marquee making art from what most of us would throw away, plastics, cardboard, etc. So we're using a lot of recycled materials here today. It's just one of the aspects of the work that I'm trying to do. 
where I use sculpture and the creative process to um, switch people on to the possibilities of the environment and sustainability and overall having fun uh, doing something for the planet at the same time. Working a lot with community such as this, working with school groups, individuals uh, and the end result can be really exciting. That little um, fish raft at the end there. What? What? How did that come about, Peter? Uh, I think you mean the canoe, do you? Or yeah. oh, this one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that was one of the first projects I did with the local school. That was Belray Primary back in two thousand and ten, I think. And I went to dis discuss with the students what they'd like to um, make and uh, what's living nearby in Spring Creek or what used to live there and perhaps we could sing up again. And in this case, it was the Eastern Long Neck Turtle. So the students and uh, myself and a couple of artist friends worked to make this their impression of this Eastern Long Neck Turtle all made from woven lamandra and different grass species. Uh, and this is it. So it was, it was an amazing looking creature at the end of the, um, the project and it became part of the High Tide Festival down at the Spring Creek River Mouth at the High Tide um, Festival opening. And the kids carried their sculpture, so proud of it. They owned it completely <laughs> and placed it in Spring Creek and then it floated off down the creek, uh, which was wonderful. And it was a metaphor for catch and release and um, just a very exciting project. There's an interesting story to this, actually, because the following day I had to go to Melbourne. Uh, I was in Melbourne for three days, came back and thought, oh, look, I'll just call by and see how the, whether Eastern Long Neck Turtle may have ended up. And in that time, the, um, the river mouth, the creek mouth opened even more and the turtle had washed upstream and there's a boardwalk across Spring Creek there with some concrete uh, pylons, if you like, and the sculpture was wrapped around the concrete pylons and it was once again a metaphor for what happens to, to nature. Mm. It was, you know, it was quite provoking actually and, and um, no one else knew that than me because uh, I followed the, the course of the sculpture. But isn't that just the way it is, you know? Yeah. The turtles swim, up, swim upstream and get tangled up in man-made structures, mm. unfortunately. Now, um, I'll see if I can share my screen again now because I, I wanted to show your work um, at the... Um, at Cape Otway Lighthouse, um, your geoglyph here um, of a whale. Well, that was another um, great opportunity that I was given. Uh, the manager at the time at Cape Otway Lighthouse called down there to, he didn't really have an idea. He just said, come on down and, you know, you might want to do some sculptures and, so I went down and um, having just returned from doing three seasons in a Kimberley, um, part of which was whale research programs, I said, well, what are you, are you showing people about the whales that swim past here every winter? So that, that started the project and um, we decided by making a sculpture of a southern right whale, that's the life size of a female southern right whale, approximately 16 metres long, um, we could draw attention to the fact that it's a major point in their migration from the Antarctic. And so I, I became the artist in residence over four months at the lighthouse, making the geoglyph 
So I found the shape in the sand hills and basically highlighted it using local Otway um, mudstone and a little bit of concrete and Corten steel. And while working on the sculpture, visitors to the lighthouse would wander past and, and you know, conversation would start and lots of people learned more about the whales in the process. The sculpture is still there to this day and there's now a, um, an ongoing data collection happening at the lighthouse and it's become a whale watching venue, if you like, which once again connects people to these amazing creatures um, that are swimming along our shores each year. And I'm really hoping to to use a lot of this data to um, to uh, do what we can to stop the seismic testing that happens out there in Bass Strait because that's one of, as you all know, one of the most devastating things going on on this planet to, to ocean health is the seismic testing by, by gas and fuel companies. Yeah, so they may not be drilling. They're still undertaking this testing. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned, Peter, or, or did I get it wrong the other day when we had our chat, that prior to you, like as you were being engaged to do this project, the idea of actually incorporating whale watching into the lighthouses, I guess, offerings didn't hadn't really occurred to them. Is that right? No, no, it hadn't at all. And um, because, as I said, I'd come back from the Kimberley and I was so fired up about whales so when I went down there, I said, well, because when I go into a, when I begin a project, it's always about, okay, what lives here? Mm -hmm. So Spring Creek, East and Longnet Turtle, Biak, Brogas, down there, what lives here? So that's why we focused on whales. I've said, well, let's talk about the whales to your visitors and let's use the art and the sculpture to connect people to what's swimming past under that lighthouse every winter. So that's how, yeah, that's exactly what happened, Stacey. And, um, and now it's very much a part of the whole program that they do at the Lighthouse. So it, it, it's a great case, um, great example rather of um, how, you know, the artwork and sculpture can be a bridge between um, the environment and, and positive change for the environment um, without being on a soapbox and banging, you know, trying to drive some opinion home to people. It, it happens in a less confrontational way and it allows people to discover it for themselves, which I think is very, very important. Yeah. And you mentioned there was a um, there was another event that went alongside this with because uh, Sea Shepherd were involved, um, I guess, in the beginnings of this project. Yeah. So... Um, we made the sculpture uh, in 2012 and then we wanted to launch the sculpture. So um, we, I went up to uh, Williamstown and knocked on and we, <coughs> we invited the Sea Shepherd crew to come down and, um, and talk at the, at the launch of the sculpture. So it sort of grew from there. We ended up with uh, 12 of them came down from the, from the Steve Irwin and they stayed a couple of nights in the lighthouse cottages and we fed them and um, we had, it was a great event. So it was called mm -hmm. The Wonder of Wales and lots of people came. 2012, it was at the lighthouse with on the, at the sculpture site and we had live music, we had, Sea Shepherd crew talking about their experiences in the Antarctic and we had local people talking about whales and their experiences and then the following year it happened in the Mechanics Hall in Apollo Bay. Um, once again art was was the um, the bridge if you like so we filled the the hall in Apollo Bay with local sculpture. Sea Shepherd crew came again. Peter Kirkhouse showed his Southern Ocean Dreaming film um it, yeah they were really great events and uh just set, it was about celebrating the whale along our coast using um 
creativity to to as a bridge yeah yeah and I think we we talked about and I think I've talked about this with all of you is that um that shared experience of um an artistic event or um or indeed encounter with an artwork can um uh, I guess engender an identification with that cause that can't sort of come about in any other way um I guess that's one of the um more unique qualities that art has and that rather than screaming a message at people um people are, are naturally naturally identify with that issue from thereafter from having shared that experience with others and um yeah anyway um and that sort of brings me to the closing of today's event because even though a lot of these um issues and particularly working in the activist space can tend to um I, I guess weigh on you heavily um sometimes when uh it feels like the winds are very few and far between um I think all of us have experienced some level of hope through your practice and through experiencing art and events such as the ones that Peter has spoken about I wonder if um I might invite each of you to sort of speak to you know how your art or your practice might have um, helped in the generation and, and maintenance of hope within yourselves. Who'd like to start? <laughs> um, I'll have a crack. Um, look, at, at the end of the day, I think with a lot of activism and art, it all it all comes back to the kids. You know. Um, whenever you go to an event, something like the the paddle outs, and you, and you just see young kids come along. My daughter came along. She was uh, 12 at the time. Her mates were there. And they were really passionate and really embracing the issue. And they, that last year, they, they spent a lot of time talking about fighting for the buy in Ecuador and what it all meant. So for me, I get a, I get a real buzz out of seeing the, the young kids, the young generation coming up, you know, um, who just are starting to, to, to understand that they have a voice and starting to use that voice. And I think that's a really, really important part of, um, of how we will move forward. And uh, it's just the buzz I get seeing that next generation come along. Do you want me to talk about the photo? No, I'll talk about the photo. Cool, you, <laughs> you talk about the photo after. <laughs> I really agree with what you said there, John. Um, uh, and I, I'm the same. I get really inspired when I see the young kids, you know, rise to, you know, their, their passion about the, um, the subjects and they really are the future. Um, and we're sort of passing the baton on to them. And, you know, I'm sure you're all aware that we, we've been a minority in our lives you know, we've been called greenies and this, that, that and everything else. All my life I've been a fringe dweller. And, um, and I'm hoping that it goes more and more mainstream, which I see is happening, um, you know, and it's, it's really inspiring when you work with, with youth and, and you see how they really care about it. And what we've seen in, in um, social media um, with the, the rallies around the world, with the kids, you know, yeah. going to school, et cetera, and fighting for climate change, it's, it's so positive. And if I could jump in and add too, um, we all sometimes can feel overwhelmed with how many different um, environmental issues are at stake. And I think one way we can help turn this thing around, especially such a big issue like climate change is for each and every one of us to make a contribution in some way, whether we've got a skill, like I've got a skill in painting, so I'm using that, but other people might be good communicators or they might simply have a lot of time on their hands that they can devote to um, helping um, in some way, or maybe they've just got some money that they can throw at it, or maybe they know somebody in high places and they can influence. So I think each and every one of us, if we can just find that thing that um, can galvanise us and it does give us hope that way when we actually act on it 
instead of just thinking, sitting back and letting other people do it. But if you just take some steps and some action yourself, it um, all helps in the momentum to get things changed. Yeah, action over apathy. And I think a lot of people do think that, that you know, oh, but I, I do think it becomes an excuse sometimes that the issues are so large and the problem is so big that people start to think that they are only one small part of it all and, and, and therefore they'll make no difference whatsoever. But anyone who's ever organised a beach clean-up will tell you that <laughs> the more people, John, the more people you can get, you know, that's just an, if, even if that's just an hour a day and like organisations like SANE, you know, they have once a month, um, you know, weedings, plantings, you know, caring for the dunes, there's so many different groups around who could always do with just that one more person to come along just to lighten the load a little bit and I mean if, and if someone happens to be driving past who is someone in power or um, who can you know make some larger decisions further down the track and sees a large group of people giving up an hour of their Sunday morning to um, volunteer and help clean up a beach or help weed the dunes or you know get up behind um, Winky Car Park and clean out the poo. <laughs> which I don't think anyone's ever wanted to do, but sometimes has, <laughs> you know, I think that says more. You see a large group of people as opposed to four or five, then that will make a really large impact. Richie, have you got anything to add? Yeah, to answer that question about how art gives us hope, like on an individual level, I don't know why, but poetry is just something I've written my whole life. And so I'd be doing it anyway. And as Deirdre was sharing, if you have a talent, why not contribute that to the greater good as well as, because you, you're going to be doing it anyway, you know, or, you know, John, Peter, did you, you're going to be doing our artwork. And um, so it's really wonderful to be uh, connecting that with other passions that we're aligned with, such as nature and uh, might be our career or other areas as well. And then uh, just as you were sharing about the, the groups, you know, when the groups connect together, you know, when, you know, same surf rider, Check Bells Beach, when they get together, there's a whole another larger group that's now mindful and active towards caring for the coast and really showing the love and beauty of what we're all for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, one of the fundamentals of life is our relationships. And being an active person for nature means that you're going to meet lots of other people that are active for nature and, and develop beautiful relationships, friendships, as well as ways you can help each other for the greater good of nature of the planet. Yeah, and that sense of camaraderie, which brings me to this image, John, <laughs> that you wanted to speak to. This is, this is one of John's own images that was taken at the Fight for the Bite um, protest. I think the initial one that was held because we did end up having a few, but, um, and I considered this image to be one of victory, um, and victory in the sense that when you're appealing to a community's association with place and with beauty, um, this identification with something that's larger than yourself. Um, and this says, you know, that makes people say, yes, this is part of me and who I am. And then we can all come together and defend what is important to us. And I think this image really reflects success in that area. Um, so, yeah. So, and while art is just like a single cog in the wheel of positive and successful activism, um, as we've shown today, it's a vital part of that wheel and um, with its gentle and unique ability to, to remind us of these connections to place and, and how important the natural environment is to all of us and, um, and the creatures that inhabit it. Um, so it gives us that daily reminder in beauty. Um, so, yeah, um, and so this forms a lovely synergy with our talk this afternoon at 2 p.m. Caroline Hawkins is a local artist and she's, um, developed a beautiful project around um, natural connections. She's um, doing uh, an installation at John Harper Centre and she'll be talking about um, how she does that. But, um, and before we go to questions, I'd like to welcome in one of our attendees and see if we can get Jackie Dreesen to join us because um, Jackie's signed in under Zoom today as as an attendee of the session, but I'd also like to invite her in. She's been central to many Surf Coast Arts Festivals. You would have known Jackie and Wild Moves International. Um, I, I'm sure many of you have come across at High Tide Festivals at, um, at 
uh, oh God, Night Jazz, um, and Jackie's also been running a lot of, um, a, a number of Zoom sessions um, called uh, Hoodie Boogie, which is based around um, the hooded plover and the protection of it. It's a, an endangered bird um, that is native to the beaches of the surf coast. Um, Connor, how are we going with getting Jackie in? I just unmuted myself. Yes. <laughs> yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Wow, how inspiring just to listen to everybody's projects and, you know, what's going on in these little pockets around our community. It's really fantastic. Thanks for letting me come on on the tail end of, of the whole session. Stacey, I'm wondering if you've got a, um, a slide from the portal of the I don't, sorry, I don't, sorry, Jackie. Um, uh, like, I, <laughs> and I, I don't think I could possibly do that. <laughs> so I'll pull one up. Stacey, you, you don't fret. I will pull okay. one up, everyone. So Thank you, Harriet. Uh, Jackie, go ahead and speak. I'll shut myself down again and I'll, no, I probably can't shut myself down because I've got to share my screen. Bear <laughs> with me, everyone. All righty. Yeah, well, um, I'm an ethno-choreologist and what we do is that uh, as choreographers we look at uh, culture from the lens of dance and, uh, you know, dance doesn't happen in a vacuum, it happens in the culture in a particular place. And so, you know, um, I'm born and bred on the surf coast so as a choreographer I've made lots of dance works about where I live and I also have to thank you know, the Torquay High Tide Festival for that because it's been wonderful to work with community on different projects like Swell Being and Natural Balance and and there's so many um, projects that we've been able to work on. But um, recently I've been working with uh, BirdLife Australia and I'm one of the friends of the Hooded Plover. So you might see me <laughs> every summer on the beach down at Point Impossible because I'm one of the wardens there. And, you know, I, I just so am in love with the hooded plovers. They are such a great little family on the beach. And as parents, they really take care of, um, you know, their eggs. And, and if you walk too close to them, you know, you wouldn't even notice that they're there unless they get up and sort of move slowly away. And it's like, oh, gosh. I thought that was just a bit of seaweed and, or, or, you know, a rock or something because they've got this amazing camouflage with these big, you know, red eyes and black cap and sandy coloured feathers and they just sort of merge into the beach environment. So, you know, I've grown up with hooded plovers and, and loving them. So what I've noticed since I've been, um, you know, particularly in the last five years as the surf coast is really exploding um, with tourism and more people living down here. Uh, so that all has a big threat on the on the hoodies. And so I decided to approach Friends of the Hooded Plover and also BirdLife Australia. Hey, you know, come on, let's um, try and find a way to use dance to um, promote how important it is that we need to find ways to share our beaches with our beach nesting birds and as Richie said you know the more connection you have to nature the more you want to care for it so yeah I was funded to write this song about the hooded plovers and it comes from the perspective of the little baby chick you know saying you know don't come too close to my nest otherwise my mum's going to freak out and she's going to lose her eggs you know, and, uh, you know, you've got to love the plove, you've got to keep us in the hood. So all the research for this song and the dance and the drumming rhythms really started with me being a warden on the beach down at, at Posso's and um, looking at their cryptic behaviour. And then I went to the Cowrie Market and I was fortunate that Surf Coast Arts Caravan would get on board and um, they helped us to make masks. So I actually interviewed and was listening to children and their parents talking, having a conversation while they're making art. And I'm listening to the words and the language that they're using. And that started to get woven into the song as well. And I would, you know, 
as you know, when you go to the carry market, everyone's got their dogs on a lead. So I'd interview them. I'd interview different people with their dogs and talk about, you know, the, the rules of what happens when the bird, the hoodie is actually on the beach and your dog's running right everywhere. So, you know, everyone has a real interest. Most people have a real interest in, in the hooded plovers. So I was able to source the language from that discussion with people at the Cowrie Market. Um, and then I, I wrote the song. So I'm fortunate to have, you know, a group of um, wild men and women in wild moves on the surf coast. And they're my uh, community drumming and dance group. And so, um, you know, we were able to create this song and dance. And you can see in the photo there, uh, the dancers are actually um, indicating the cryptic behaviour that the hooded plovers use. So if you are actually walking along the beach and you're too close to their nest and you can't see it because it's camouflaged. So the, the parents actually take on this cryptic behavior with their arm as if they're, they're dying or they've got a broken wing, which catches your attention or the attention of a Pacific gull or some other predator that could eat their little chick. And uh, so while parents are doing cryptic behavior the little chick is running in the opposite direction you know to try and um, not be caught so that's where the dogs come in because if you've got a dog off a lead you're got the attention on the parents doing this weird cryptic behavior and your dog's running up off after the chick so this song is all from the perspective of the chick you know I've got to get to 35 days because once they get to 35 days they're fledging and they can fly away from danger. So, you know, um, their habitat is at risk. And, um, you know, I've taken this into the school, Surf Coast Secondary College and St. Therese, and then COVID kicked in. So that put a stop to all of that. But um, it's been great to be able to teach the drumming and the dance and the song to the kids at school and to the broader community. And that means that people have a chance to not only understand the relationship or their relationship in connection to the hooded plover and the land that we live on, but they actually embody the actual bird itself by looking at the movements. So they're using the kinesthetic sense to be able to understand the reason why this little bird has this cryptic behavior and has this great camouflage that we can't see them on the beach. And they have their nest in, in 360 degrees, you know, so that they've got full view of where their predators are. So yeah, if anybody wants to try the drumming and dance rhythms, they're on a Monday night at 5.30 uh, online on Zoom. And um, for the rest of August, they're free. So, uh, you know, there's not much time left in August. So jump on board. On That'd that. Be <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Monday nights is the dance and Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock is the drumming. It's on Zoom now, but usually it would be down at um, Belbray Heart Space. Uh, we have our community drumming and dance down there. So, yeah, that's the hoodie boogie. Jackie, that's awesome. Um, yeah, and you can find the links to that via our Facebook page and our website if you're interested in, in signing up for a fun Monday night activity. It sounds also I might get the kids involved in that. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, thanks for popping in at such late notice too. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity for jumping on. No worries. Um, we've just got a couple of questions at the end um, here. So, uh I, I don't know, um, Jerry Barr has asked this question of Deidre. Um, are you doing the Plastic Catch series now, Deidre, and leaving them around, or has COVID put a stop to that? Well, I did. I, the last one I left was um, in March, and with COVID, I thought people probably didn't want to be picking up random bits of paintings. <laughs> so um, I haven't been putting any out yet. But you have been... Um, but you have actually been doing some work um, that's, that was somewhat motivated by COVID since then too in your postcards project. You okay. Um, yeah, well, the um, during the first lockdown, I was going to Southside and um, taking a photo of the sunrise. Basically, I was just trying to connect with nature because it, 
when it hit, nobody kind of knew what was ahead and it was very uncertain times and connecting with nature is a lovely way to stay grounded. And so I would take a photo of the sunrise and then come back to the studio and paint it. And then I've been, um, well, I've been doing them as a postcard and sending them to family and friends. And on the back, I have all the weather data that I can collect. So, you know, size of the waves, the wind direction, the water temperature, the air temperature, etc. Because I think you know, all our weather observations are so important as we enter this period of climate change. And, um, and then of course the Surf Coast Shire came up with this postcards project. So I was able to contribute some of those postcards to your postcard project where you were sending them to people who are vulnerable in the community as a symbol of hope. Because I mean, the dawn is a symbol of hope, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. A bit of um, synergy with Richie's Hundred dawns, dawn, very much so. But and and as you can see within Hundred Dawns, and as Richie experienced doing Hundred Dawns, he can be in the same place every day, but it looks so completely different. Like and just looking at, I think when I when I last came to your studio, DJ, you, you you'd done probably about not quite twenty, but every single one of them looked completely different. And mm. um, yeah, not to mention all the weather data that you're putting on the back. Um, Jerry's actually asked another question of Peter. Um, oh, actually, that, that was, um, yeah, she asked Peter, what are you working on at the moment? And I think, Peter, you said this to me the other day that you're actually not able to, uh, a few of the projects that you had up and running to engage, um, uh, I think there were some young people projects, uh, people <laughs> projects involving young people, but you haven't been able to get to them. Is that right? Yes, we were um, we we're about to undertake a project which was linking five different schools in the region, um, and each school would be working with a particular uh, bird or mammal or invertebrate from their area. Um, the sculptures were all well. This will happen down the track, so the the sculptures will all be made, and then. The five different schools, through using the Kids Teaching Kids model, will share their knowledge with the other schools, if you like. And so it creates, the, once again, it's a metaphor for a wildlife corridor between the students, the locations, and it will culminate with an exhibition at the end. So this is a project that's being funded by Regional Arts Victoria, which we're really excited about. Um, BIAC School is the hub of the Wildlife Corridor and that's, I'm working on it, but obviously we can't go into the schools at the moment. So it's happening to a certain degree. Um, and then, yeah, I'm still working on, you know, sculptures, sculptures in my shed and uh, we do a lot of ephemeral um, actions out in nature that I don't really advertise or tell people much about, but Amanda and I, we go out and we make ephemeral sculpture, pop it into the landscape and just let it do its thing. Once again, sending little messages out to whoever wanders past. So there's plenty going on, still plenty going on. Yeah. And that beautiful little interventions, there's a, um, like as Caroline's doing now, and um, Patty Behrens is um, another local artist. She's just recently set up um, some ephemeral work in the Moona Forest at Point Road Night. And it's so lovely coming across something like that that makes you look twice. You think it is part of nature, but yeah, yeah, it, you had to do a double take. Yeah. And it's great to see more and more people doing it. It's, yeah. it's really wonderful. You know, it started in really simple terms with the little rock stacks on the beaches, yeah. which took off everywhere. And now there's all sorts of beautiful little sculptures being made by people along the walking tracks through the Otways and the surf coast. It's yeah, it's wonderful. It just gives you that connection, I think. Um, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Paula asks if um, there's anything going on at the moment for engaging young people and teenagers during isolation, and whether anyone has any online projects going on. But as part of Portal, we 
started the Postcards Project to help connect people through creating small postcards and um, we're sending them out to, I guess, the vulnerable, um, that some of them are going to um, identified isolated and vulnerable people within the community, but, but you will also receive a couple in return. So it's sort of like an anonymous, um, I guess, pen pal, you'll be receiving some, uh, a, another work of art from another artist. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that already, do that, that'd be perfect for, um, adolescents, teenagers, and people of all ages, really. Um, and we've also got um, a bin art project going on. We're encouraging everyone to um, add some art to their wheelie bins, which are normally pretty hideous looking things sitting on the side of the road. And yeah. um, so we're encouraging families to decorate those and just sort of brighten their street and, you know, create talking points between um neighbourhoods. Um, so Courage, the council officer has to jump in here and say, we absolutely encourage you to paint your bins. Please don't paint over the Surf Coast Shire logo though, <laughs> because if you do, the cleaning company won't pick, get rid of your rubbish for you. So paint it as wildly <laughs> as you like. Don't be offensive or scary and don't go over the logo. Yeah. Create some beauty. Um, and also, obviously, there's Jackie's fabulous, you know, if you get those kids moving, yeah. if you're not moving, you know, sign them up on the on Mondays. Well, there's this Monday, but then you could sign up. I'm sure it's not hugely expensive. Sign up going forward. Drumming and dancing. Get them moving. Oh, August, it's actually free. So yeah. jump on. <laughs> um, um, I want to, Stace, did you have anything more to say? Because I just wanted to thank you all so much. What an incredibly inspiring and informative session. Um, it's We're so grateful behind the scenes here at Portal to every single artist that's joined us for these discussions. It was something that we don't do a lot of in the show or haven't, at least in my time. So it's fabulous to get different people's perspectives and to really see how people are engaging with their practice and their place. So obviously continuing on with the theme of art, action and place, please do make sure that you tune in this afternoon at 2pm for the launch of Natural Connections. Um, I believe that this is an incredibly important and timely project which uh, has been funded by Surf Coast Shire through our Arts Development Seed Fund. That's um, the Arts Development Seed Fund. This is its second year and we are always concentrating on projects that link environment and art. So look out for it next. Um, we'll be opening that for applications come next March. But do take a look, there's three projects that have been funded this year and Carolyn's is the first that will be hitting the ground. Um, she's doing it in conjunction with Rebecca Hosking and Droll Car Buddhist Centre. And the project offers ways for participants to cultivate a connection to nature and promote greater emotional wellbeing and a necessity as we face the difficult reality of climate change. Um, as we head towards the final session of this phase of Portal. So if you're not aware, Portal was a three month project. We started at the beginning of June with our Elevate series of workshops for artists. Then we went to our Women in Conversation series in July, and now we've had these sort of bigger picture discussions. And this is the second last one. I do say this phase of Portal though, because we are actively seeking funding to continue it. We understand how important portal has been for the community, the incredible new connections that have been made and the collaborations that are happening in response. So we we feel it's really important as we sort of are in this, you know, this state of unknowing, which is COVID. So yeah, we're out there writing grant applications at midnight and things. So we do hope to bring you some more. But um, next Sunday, before we finish up, you're gonna join Surf Coast, oh, well, actually, next Saturday morning, please join Surf Coast Art Inc's president, Helen Gibbons, to learn about the hugely exciting new development in the arts on the Surf Coast, the conversion of the old sport and rec center in Torquay into a community run multi-art center. Uh, you'll be joining Helen in conversation with the multi-art center or the MAX chair, George Carmen, Torquay Theatre Troops, Gay Bell, art space president, Sally Groom, and photographer and emerging cultural leader, Daniela Rodriguez. And then on Sunday, we do move to the last of our Sunday morning sessions, where to now the future of the arts on the surf coast. This one's going to be facilitated by Geelong Regional Gallery's CEO and director, Jason Smith. And he'll be joined by some of the Shire's leading artists and producers to think about where we go from here. 
Then our last session on this sort of this theme of, you know, the environment, what it means to place, what it means to us as a people. Uh, please join me in conversation with the Float crew. If any of you watching today or any of you who've been on this panel don't know Float, look it up. Uh, it's Float Lake Tyres. Learn how this amazing collection of environmentalists, artists and environmental scientists came together to help invigorate their far east Gippsland communities through an incredible array of arts projects, culture and environmental action. Seriously, folks, these guys are doing amazing things. If you don't know what float is, look it up. And I'm sure that we'll be having lots of artists go, oh my God, I have to go and have a residency there. <laughs> so details for all of these events and more can be found at www.surfcoastartstrail.com.au. Thank you again to all our fabulous artists. You really can do. I thank everyone once again. Thank you to yeah. each and every one of these panellists this morning. And I skimmed over the fact that maybe I should have introduced each one of you <laughs> and talked about your previous work. Um, so I'd like to direct everyone to the artist page on the Surf Coast Arts Trail website just to check out the wonderful work that each of these artists who have joined us this morning are doing. Um, there's links to their former and current work and um, each of these people have done a lot um, both within their practice and outside in their personal lives to um, do a lot of work to conserve the beautiful environment we have here on the sunshine, uh, sunshine on the surf coast. So um, I think that was a bit of a Freudian slip there, <laughs> given today. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you each of you for agreeing to be on the panel this morning. It's an honour to talk to each of you and um, yeah, have a great Sunday, each of you. Thanks everyone. Thanks thank everyone you. for joining us and um, see you next week. Or oh, no, see you this afternoon. Yes. Stacey, do you want to stay with me? Okay. Thanks everyone. Adios. Have a good Sunday.